Hey, everybody. I'm here tonight with um, a friend of mine and uh, an author who I published through Enrealman Press. Uh, her name is Kelly McNeilis. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about her. She's the founder of Women for One, a global community that empowers women to embrace their voices and make life happen on their terms. With over 20 years of experience as a nonprofit and small business consultant, Kelly empowers generations of women around the world to build the relationships, community, and confidence they need to achieve their wildest dreams. She travels the world as a speaker, teacher, and facilitator of workshops, helping others tap into lives powered by truth. Kelly's dedication to truth-telling helps women and men share their powerful stories with the world. She's a best-selling author whose first book, Your Messy Brilliance, <laughs> Seven Tools for the Perfectly Imperfect Woman, was released in fall 2017 by Enrealment Press. Kelly has appeared in numerous national and international publications, as well as on radio and television. She was featured in the April 2019 issues of Entrepreneur and O Magazines. She finds daily inspiration in spending time with her husband and children in her home outside of Seattle. Nice. Hello, Kelly. Hi, Jeff. Hi. So I thought maybe I'd read, there's an endorsement for the book uh, that was written by um, best-selling author and now presidential candidate, Marion <laughs> Williamson. Look at that. That's right. And let me start before you start with that. I'm yeah. really honored to be here. Um, Tim Ryan is actually a truth teller as well. And Tim Ryan is running for president as well. Just just wanted to give him kudos as well as the man that's running. Ex excellent. So you have presidential <laughs> candidates that are endorsing Two. your work. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> And I can't get any of them to talk to me. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, oh, well. It's okay. Yeah, what are you going to do? Um, all right, so let me just read Marion's uh, quote for the book, okay? Uh, quote, Kelly McNeilis names something very important in your messy brilliance, bringing to light the secret fear we all have at times that we're too messed up to be good enough. Her message, that where there's no mess, there's no becoming, no real life, no real brilliance, is both a relief and a tremendous step forward for anyone caught in the trap of I'm not good enough thinking. There's a lot of good information and a lot of good love in this book. I recommend it. Close quote. I agree with that. I like this book a lot. There's, there's a, you know, yeah. somebody, if somebody can really create the space in their worlds, which we all know is so difficult right now, um, to really embed themselves in the process that you take them through in the book, there's no way they're not going to come out at the other end in a, in a transformed state. Um, it's, it's really profound. It's that's how I feel about your books. I, that's why I was drawn to you at first. They're amazing. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> we can I'm, just I'm being endorsed uh, by someone who's connected to presidential candidates. This is unbelievable. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> for our Canadian even. <laughs> so, so um, all all um, um, lightheartedness aside, um, one of the things that prompted your book was your own experience around um, sexual abuse um, in early life. Um, are you are you just open to sharing a little bit about that um, to the extent that you're sure. comfortable, and how how that experience links to uh, the the message that you're contributing through this book? Um, in terms of the importance of really being able to surrender to chaotic, chaotic process and unresolved material as part of your own transformation. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of what I went through, you know, I was just for a, a reference point, I was sexually abused by my father when I was four. He was an alcoholic. And um, my mom, when I asked her about it, because I repressed the memory, Jeff, until I was 30. So that's the other thing I want to talk about, because that's a really important point there. You know, the repressed memories, you know, the, the survival skills a lot of a lot of people do and, and, you know, employ to move forward in their lives. By doing that, then they're shamed later because it's not really happening or it didn't really happen. Um, when I, I spoke with my mom about it, because my dad died when, when I was 17, she's like, well, I don't know. All I remember is your dad used to be drunk and was all over me, so I just put you in the bed with him. And that was as much of a betrayal yeah. as the actual abuse, right? By, so by your mother and your father getting betrayed in both ways um, was really, 
tough. But the, the wild thing was I had to go into hypnosis and I had clues for years with my sexuality and understanding my relationship with men um, and myself sexually, what was happening. Like I had to figure out and piece it together, the puzzle pieces through hypnosis. And I think a lot of us have to do that. And, you know, I, I watched the Michael Jackson, um, the whole uh, what it's called the documentary around that. And it just, it was so triggering for me because these, these men had hidden what they did, but they had hidden it from themselves in ways because that's how they survived. And you talk a lot about that. Yeah. And so I think there's just this place where, you know, there's secret keeping, there's shame. We're brought up in a society of secret keepers. I've talked about in the past. Um, but then we forget who we are. When, you know, I was just talking to a group of women about an hour ago. We put our masks on and we become our masks. And that's what happened to me until I went into complete crisis in my life around the age of 28 going, what the hell am I doing with my life? Like, this isn't who I am. Like, you know, the talking head song that I always talk about when I get interviewed, you know, this isn't my beautiful wife. Like, I, I don't know where I am. That's what happened to me. I had an aha moment. And I woke up literally and started piecing myself and, and crawling my way out of unconsciousness to look into my wounds. And, and if you were to look just at your life to that point, up to the age of 28, the, your confusion as to directionality and path, for example, do you link all of that to this repressed material or just some of that to the repressed material? Like, like what is the connection between the repressed material and the way that you were living things out in your daily life? Well, you know, I talk about this <laughs> with all the people I work with. We have millions and millions of stories inside of us and, 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 uh, you know, unlimited experiences in our lives. So no, I don't connect all of it, but I all, I connect some of it. And what, I've been teaching in my retreats these days is these safe versus vulnerable stories. So my safe story actually is my sexual abuse. And I always thought that was my vulnerable story, but because I define myself by my safe story, which was what Sonny Don Johnson actually pointed out to me was my safe story. Cause I could go, hi, I'm an incest survivor and this is what happened to me. And I define myself by this and I have issues with men and I went through it. I dug deeper into the layers and went, wait a minute. That's my safe story. What's my vulnerable story? My vulnerable story is what's up for me right now. Like you asked me a few minutes ago, what's up for you right now? And what's up for me now is like my intimacy with myself, my intimacy with my husband, sexually, you know, emotionally, physically, it's every way. It's, 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 that's the vulnerable space. Like when I feel these bouts of depression coming up and I'm sitting there going, what is that? And I get curious about it. That's my vulnerable story versus my safe story that I attached myself to for years, which wasn't all, and it doesn't define me. And I think all of us need to go there more, Jeff, like where we don't define ourselves by this one experience we've had or one or two or three traumatic experiences. We have so many in our lives that we wrap our storyline around and our belief systems around. I mean, I guess it depends on the, the nature of the trauma, the way the receiver experienced the right. trauma, you know. Mm -hmm. What's, what's a small T trauma for somebody is a big T trauma for somebody else. I always try to remember that, that it's so yep. very individualized. Um, but in order for you to move from the place where you couldn't acknowledge it, recognize it, excavate it, see it, and remember it, to the place where you saw it then as a safe story that was in a way hemming you in to this kind of limiting framework of identity, so now right. this place where you moved off of that in the direction of being able to talk about what's vulnerably true for you in this moment, um, that's a lot of steps for most people. Yeah, that actually made me feel really good that you told me I walked Absolutely, that. <laughs> that's really beautiful, you know? Right, right. Yeah, and if, we, and if we just spent our time just telling you to stop with your victimhood story, that wouldn't have helped because no. you needed to really excavate the story and own the feelings and... So mm -hmm. if you were to like tell people who are at a stage in their own development where they sense that there's a whole wave of repressed material, it doesn't have to be sexual abuse material, it can be anything. anything, stuff that they've blocked off from consciousness in order to stay alive and survive and move forward in their lives, mm -hmm. to reach the point where they can bring it to the surface and then move beyond it to the point where it no longer has a lot of identifying or obstructive charge. Right. What are the steps? I mean, because I think that 
you know, we're now normalizing the conversation around trauma. Um, we're understanding that we can't talk about spirituality if we don't talk about trauma. So, I mean, you know, I've been saying this forever and, and right. I feel like it's really wonderful to see it's becoming part of our cultural narrative now, but at the same time, people don't know what to do. They don't know how to get from one place to the next. So what are some suggestions on how they can move into the excavation of the material and to the point where they're freed of the sense that that's identifying them? Yeah, well, that's such a great question, and I'm still working it, right? But I think patience with ourselves, um, getting curious about where we are, um, the tools of my book, having an awareness of where we are in this moment, diving into the story that's up for us right now. Like you said to me before, what's up for you right now? You know, starting with what's in front of you, I think is really important. Um, that's, I mean, that's where I would start, is the curiosity and that awareness. But I also think, you know, in our society, we're so hard on ourselves and we're <coughs> like, push, push, push. Let's get this done, you know? And it's like, where is the softness? Where is the kindness to ourselves? Where is the unplugging? That's the point where I think yeah, right we, got a, now, we got a real problem right now. You know, we have a real problem. I mean, I'm noticing it. I have a real problem. I mean, I gotta be honest, you know, I'm on social media all the time. I don't enjoy social media right now. It's yeah. like, and it's like, we have to start unplugging and connecting and replugging into ourselves. Finding our own resources is so important. I think getting those clues with the curiosity helps, but then when you can do that, you can find your own resources because that victimhood, which we all have experienced, um, is about that we don't feel like we have our own resources. It's not all about it, but it's, it's part, part of it. it. It's part of it. So we can find our own resources. We can move into a space where we can explore and be curious about things. You so know, that's it, where I would start. I mean, it's true. It's like, you know, if it, I mean, how can you look at yourself if you're always looking at your phone? You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's really that simple in a way that mm -hmm. time spent on that phone. I was, I was at a coffee shop today and I looked around and, there was like nine people and all nine of them were all nine of them were looking at their phones. It was like, yeah. so that's a lot of, I mean, not that there isn't something of value there, but at the same time, you know, I th think back on when I started to really do deeper work in, in the eighties and really in the nineties. Um, and it was like, it was such a simple reality then. I mean, it didn't seem so simple to me. I was a student, I was selling windows, I was overwhelmed in many ways, but it was nothing compared to this. You know, I mean, right. I had a phone. If I wanted to disconnect from the world, I either put it off the hook or I unplugged the phone. It was that, that was the whole right. story, end of story. No other real way to engage me unless you came banging on my door. Um, and now there's 500,000 different ways to find us. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Reality. Yeah, so, so finding your own resources, being patient, and getting curious, and having an awareness is big. Got it. And any patterns that you developed as a result of that particular web of repressed material, do you still feel as though any of that lives itself out in the way you move through the world? So I asked, for example, this question, right? <laughs> so I had a lot of trauma in my early life, and I started to move real quickly. I called myself the altar boy. I could alter myself. Um, I was always in motion, you know, because a, a moving target was harder to fell. Um, mm. And I still find it just became a way of being. It's no longer a way of being that's intended to disconnect me from unresolved material, but it becomes a way of moving through the world and identifying reality. Do you still experience some of the patterns that you used in response that are, are still living themselves yes. out. And I love that you said that because it made me think of me. Like, um, I move really fast and I've got a, a, a severe case of ADD that I've made my gift in a lot of ways. I'm a multitasker. Um, so I, I, I in, in the book that I talk about your messy brilliance, my mess is my brilliance. My craziness, I have, you know, I am intending to create my brilliance through that. And so the patterns that you're talking about are the mess that I created and moving it into brilliance and alchemizing it into brilliance because that's all we have is our mess. And I truly believe that. <laughs> so when you talk about, are there specific patterns? Of course it's, it's layers, right? Jeff, we talk about it. It's like, it's layers. We just keep cutting through the layers, right? So I'm always revisiting my issues with men. You know, I had this man the other day say to me, Kelly, and he pointed at me, and we were out to dinner. It was with one of my dear friend's husbands that I was getting to know. And he's like, I can't nail you down. 
Like, I can't, like, where are you? And he was very real with me. And I appreciated his honesty and authenticity. And, it, and you know, when you can just feel that from someone, a lot of times when men uh, address me and confront me, I get, I freak out and I, I watch myself doing it. And, but with him, I was like, no, he's being real. He wants to know like why he can't connect with me. And I looked at him and I was like, well, Michael, here's the deal. I don't like, I don't like men very much. That's my story. I tell myself and, and I'm working it right. And you're intense. And you're all over the place, kind of like I am. So I just check out when I'm with you. I watch myself do it. And, and you know, it's those steps of change. I have to go, oh, there, I'm doing it again. And I have to be patient and let myself come back to where I am now and go, next time, make it, maybe I can make a different choice. But just not judging myself for that space of those patterns and also yeah. alchemizing it into my, my beauty and my brilliance and, and forgiving myself for it. I mean, we don't want to share share our truest self with every person anyway even and that's a healthy you know selective right. a, selective attachment serves us so so from one truth teller to another then i'm now prompted to ask this question is there any way in this moment in our interaction you're experience any experiencing any kind of conscious or even unconscious negative transference with me because i'm i'm a dude oh i'm sure i am and i don't even i'm not conscious of it I mean, you remind you you hold a really safe space, so I don't I feel very safe with you because of our experiences over and over for years. Um, but remember the first time I interviewed you, I named it. The moment I got on the phone, I had never felt it. I was like, I just want to let you know my body's kind of on fire right now because you're fiery. And I just I always tap into people I interview. And so I felt this fire when I was like, and I just have to name it. So it kind of goes, you know, dissipates a little so we can have the real conversation. So I think naming where you are with someone is really helpful as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Helpful. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'm feeling good right now. <laughs> good. So women for one, how long has women for one been in existence as an organization? Since 2011. Okay. That's a long time. Yeah. Uh, and, and you've done various truth teller tours. I think. Yes. And I, I talk about the tours. They're different. You know, I have women that share their story on my site. We have over 1,200 uh, women that have shared their stories and men, some, a few brave men. We always say some men are on there as well. Um, <laughs> a few brave men. <laughs> <laughs> a few brave men. Um, but, but the tours came up a couple years ago, um, right after the book launch, because I thought, you know, there are these TED Talks and they're from the head. But what about we, what about if we do something where, women share from the heart with sisterhood. And so when we started it, it, it was just magical. We did one in Boulder, we did one in Atlanta, we've done one in Seattle, and now we're shifting them into doing them in universities. And I've got three universities signed up right now. So it's pretty amazing to That's do fantastic. them in, with the young women um, sharing their stories and their truth. And when they're sharing their stories, they're sharing all kinds of stories, right? Including tales of sexual abuse, anything, anything goes. Anything, entrepreneurship, um, physical challenges that they've overcome, yeah. um, really the lessons and wisdom they've gained. It's, it's, it's a journey for both and an experience for both the, the people sitting there. I don't like to call them the audience because they're really participants. The women that are holding space. In, you know, and the men that are in the audience. And then the people on the stage are transforming themselves by speaking this. Because I believe when you speak truth, it's even more solidifying sometimes than writing it from that voice place, from the, the throat chakra. So it, it is just really beautiful to see what's happening. I mean, if you, if you think about, you know, the way we've been so collectively shamed, that to be able to create shame circles where we self-reveal and are held safely in that is... I mean, this is revolutionary on this planet, really. Mm -hmm. you know, we've been repressing our material for centuries. So even to begin yes. to have this conversation is, it's just, rem it seems remarkable to me, you know? It seems remarkable and also so normal. Yeah. In the same well, moment, right. but, you know, because when I go into these spaces, I feel like a mama bear with the women that have decided to do this and that we've chosen to come up on stage. And then when they do it, I never allow anyone to question them. I allow people to share their experiences. Like I had an aha, but it's not a Q and A after like when you're, you know, up there and you're selling a book or something. This is a truly, if you want to say like a spiritual experience, it's a connection of sisterhood when you're in that room. And it's an experience for everyone in there, not just the women on stage. It's amazing. You're going to come to Canada? 
the true I'd love to. tour. Yeah. I'd love to. I think it'd be awesome. It's it's really special. It's it's where my my juice and my energy is right now. Got it. Mm -hmm. uh, so looking ahead, next couple of years, what do you what do you see coming both within your own interior process and with respect to your the message you're bringing to the world? You know, Jeff, this world right now. I don't have to tell you. I've yeah, we can talk place. about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you start to feel hopeless about your offering sometimes, right? Like, like what's the fucking point in the heart of this madness? You know, <laughs> I, I, I told you, I feel I'm that way and I never <laughs> feel that way. But every time I look at baby Donald's face, I go, what's the fucking point? And you know, I mean, well, I get my news from um, Stephen Colbert. I don't watch the news. I watch Stephen Colbert because yep. yes, it's skewed, but you know what? I love him. And that's the only way I can handle it. Yeah, really he's, I like him. He's great. <laughs> um, but I guess, I, I told you at the beginning of the call where I am and I knew you'd ask me this. So I, I thought about it when I got up and meditated this morning, I was like, I'm feeling deeply. That's where I am. I'm yeah. feeling the, the highs and the lows deeply. You know, I, my husband is turning 61 tomorrow and you know, I gotta be honest, 60 was really old to me years ago. <laughs> so I'm like, I can't believe I'm married to a 61 year old. Like, it's pretty amazing. Like that life is going fast and it's, it's speeding through. And I have children ages 19 to 25 now. I'm like, what? I still feel like I'm 25. So in that way, I, I'm feeling um, the need to slow down and experience in a deep, deep way. And I'm also feeling the lows of what's going on in our world. I've been watching Handmaid's Tale. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. But I, I don't think incredible. I, I want to see it right now. But Actually, it, it really touched me deeply because it's, it's an experience of what you know, could happen to our country if, yeah. in America if it happened. And then I'm feeling the highs of the connection of family and myself and my soul right now. So it's an interesting dichotomy to me to be feeling the lows and the highs at the same time. And I'm trying, I'm in confusion about how to move forward and, and reconcile the two. Yeah. That's really where I am. Sounds like in real to me. <laughs> Just being real. I'm trying. <laughs> that's, that's where I am. That's what it is. It's all happening at the same time. And uh, yeah. Opposites coexist. And I believe that. And so I'm just, I'm sitting with it and I, I, I really do believe, and I, I've I wrote this in the book, but, and one of the best teacher I've ever had said, you know, I'm really trying to be the best kidney cell I can be. And I don't know if you remember that, but mm -hmm. the kidney cell analogy is all we can do in this world is be the best we can be for the universe. That's all connected. And, 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 to really get as aware and in real and grounded and, and powerful inside ourselves as possible and aware of where we are, because that's how we will serve the world. So that's what I'm trying to do more of. And it's not woo woo. It's just being grounded and real. There's nothing woo woo about that. I know yeah. Ram, I went to Ram Dass many, many years ago when I had a decision to make whether to go and help or save a family member again or whether and stop writing or whether to continue and he and i paraphrase but he said um he said you know the most you the most you can do to become all that you're meant to become is the most you can do for all of us and you know i don't know maybe it was because it was the way ram Dass said it to me or something you know it was like it was it was really felt true to me it was mm. you know and that's and that's really something i mean if you can really find a way to reach a stage where you're actualizing so many of your aspects and holding them all in your consciousness and in your actions and at the same time it's it's remarkable what you can do to affect change in this world you know it is it but it's different like you said than going up on a mountain and meditating yeah and, no and holier still. than now but yeah. a lot of people get that confused from the being the yeah. best that you can be right well, that's that's the, there's a difference between developing on a multi-aspected or polyphrenic level versus doing what patriarchal spirituality all these mastery baiters have been doing for centuries which is, <laughs> which, I love is it. <laughs> which is perfecting singular threads of consciousness and calling that awakening while avoiding all the other aspects of the human experience that they don't want anything to do with so bashing the ego bashing the body bashing your feelings bashing your stories bashing yourself 
in the quest for some equanimity experience and some absolute consciousness field. That is not working. If it was, the species wouldn't be so bloody fucked up. Um, what we need are grounded, enrealed, integrated, heart-centered, embodied, horizontal, not only vertical spiritualities, because if you're only looking here or pondering your navel, the reality is you won't notice anything that's happening to anyone around you. You won't care right. about it, and you won't notice what's happening to our planet. So it's time to ground our spirituality. It really is our only hope. I know we've talked a lot about that before, but I, I think it's true. It really is. And it, it gives me hope when little things like uh, we were driving away, you know, the Cayman Islands. So my daughter, who's 19, we were driving away to the airport to leave. And she looked over and there's this trash island. They don't recycle. I don't know what made me think of it when you said that. And tears started falling down her face. And it gave me hope because <laughs> it was like, yeah. that's how deeply affected my daughter is. Yeah. The fact that of our unconscious choices in this world around just around that choice we've made. Right. So there's all these things in our world right now, you know, and deeply feeling it and, and then manifesting that into some sort of action, I think is, is really where we need to move forward. I totally agree. I mean, you're not going to get rid of baby Donald uh, by meditating or praying. It's not going to work. You have to get your boots on the ground and actually do something to change things. Yeah. Yeah. And we got to get the guns out of, out of our country. I, yeah. I, I'm just disgusted by it. I, I don't even know what to say anymore. Yeah. I heard from someone the other day that you, that you could go into Walmart and buy a gun for your kid, that there's like a yeah. kid, kid gun section or something. Uh, it's just it's shocking and it's just the unconsciousness of everything but you know there is a place where he is representing the underbelly of our country there are a lot of people that still support him about f i think about 40 percent of america uh, resonates with him yeah it's two, shocking. like two out of every five americans that walk past you are re resonant with with donald trump Something. Yeah, and I mean, at least it's, I mean, if there's anything good at all about this, I don't even want to use the word good. That's a terrible word. It's bringing it to consciousness. It's bringing it to light. It's not shoving down the underbelly. It's turning it up. So we need to rise up now. That's where I look. Again, once again. And I'm glad my kids are half Canadian. <laughs> right. Canada, Canada rocks. You know. Even in the Handmaid's Tale, Canada rocks. So, Canada you know. rocks. Well, Margaret Atwood's a Canadian. She lives in Toronto. An admiral. I mean, absolutely. Hey, Justin Trudeau rocks. You know, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Kelly. Um, anything else you want to speak to? No, I just want to thank you for what you do and your, your courage. You've really inspired me. And I'm not just blowing, blowing to, you know, you inspire me with your courage to be able to speak truth um, so unabashedly and really engage with people that um, want to fight with you where you just really speak truth and are kind and compassionate. You're not trying to bash them. You're just being real. And I appreciate that. It yeah, really, it, you're yeah. a teacher to me. And I think you're a teacher to a lot of people that way. And I, I don't think you're celebrated enough for that. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, you know, I think that we seem to understand that it's okay to debate political decisions, legal decisions, but if any, anybody dares to critically review spiritual teachings, all of a sudden it's blasphemy, you know, talk about it. What, what a control system that is. It's perfect. <laughs> do whatever the fuck you want to do and no one's allowed to discuss it. It's like, what a thing. So yeah. I'll keep, I'll keep that up. Um, so, <laughs> Good. Yeah, absolutely. So they can find your work at uh, where? Just remind me of the website again. Women for one, women for one com, all spelled out in, in words. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can submit for free on our site and get your story professionally edited. I'd love to hear from you. And there's a lot of great things on our site. There's a lot of truth telling. There's an incredible sisterhood. And we have a lot of tools for women to be able to really dive into their voice and claim it. And I think you as an author have a page on Facebook, if I'm not mistaken, in your name. I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Right. Thank Messy you. brilliance. <laughs> Messy brilliance. Great. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. You. Thank you. Good seeing you. Nice to see you. Bye.